or what is the olive tree in Romans 11? Can we identify it with certainty? Or is it some mystical truth that can't be pinned down? Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Lee Brainerd and welcome to Soothkeep and another edition of Prophecy in the Crucible. My mission is truth, truth at any cost, truth above every other consideration. So what is the identification of the olive tree in Romans 11? The traditional view insists that the olive tree is the church. This makes no sense in my mind. First of all, the tree already existed when Jesus was on earth. The tree was characterized by Jewish branches. On top of that, when Jesus was on earth, the church was yet future. Matthew 16, 18 says, I will build my church. Notice, I will build my church. Not, I'm going to improve my church. Not, I'm going to add to my church. Not, I'm going to change my church. I will build my church. And the fact is, the foundation wasn't even yet laid. We read clearly in the scriptures that the apostles and Jesus himself were the foundation of the church. The foundation of the church did not exist until Jesus was on earth. Secondly, the tree already existed when the Gentiles were grafted in. You had Gentile branches added to the existing Jewish branches. Now, the Gentile branches plus the Jewish branches equal the church, which Ephesians 2.15 tells us is one new man. Now, this is a clear distinction between the pre-existent tree and the one new man. If the tree already existed and the church didn't exist, the one new man didn't exist, the Gentile branches didn't exist, the mixture of the Gentile and Jewish branches didn't mix, hadn't been mixed already, then there is a clear distinction between the pre-existent tree and the church. Thirdly, if the tree is intrinsically the church, how come the Gentile Christians are wild olive branches? That makes no sense. The truth is, the idea that the tree is the church is a theory that men have embraced because it's a convenient simplification. It simplifies things. It, they don't have to think through them. They don't have to deal with all the difficult issues that come up to the question. But whenever men embrace an oversimplification, they trample on facts and data. Folks, we want to aim for Occam's razor or an elegant solution. We don't want the simplest solution. We want the simplest solution that harmonizes all the data. And this means that truth will sometimes be slandered as too complicated. Now the Hebrew roots view insists that the tree is Israel. This view is exactly the opposite of the traditional church view. This view claims there's no such thing as the church. The idea of the church is Catholic fiction that was introduced in the 3rd or 4th century. In their mind, Israel is the only redemptive body. After the cross, God expanded Israel to include the Gentiles. He began grafting Gentiles into the olive tree. But this solution faces the same problem that the traditional view faces. The tree and the branches are distinct. Notice the testimony of Romans 11.24. The Gentiles are wild olive branches that are grafted in. They're a different tree, and they're a different variety of tree. They are not the tree. And in Romans 11.24, we also read that Israel shall be grafted into their own olive tree. Now, being grafted into their own olive tree is not equivalent to they are the olive tree. If you are grafted into the tree, you are not the tree. And their own olive tree is telling us that they have a special relationship to the tree. It's not telling us that they and the tree are equivalent. Folks, if Israel has a special relationship with the olive tree, she can't be the olive tree. If you have a special relationship with someone else, you are not that other person. And folks, 
This is the only logical way to look at this. God is very logical in this matter. Now there are several important observations that we need to make about this olive tree. First of all, there is a qualitative distinction between the tree and the roots. Notice that Romans 11.18 says very clearly that the root supports the branches. The roots draw nourishment from the ground to feed the branches. Now the trunk carries this nourishment to the branches. So the tree, which is the combination of the roots and the trunk, is the nourisher. And the branches are the nourished, the nourished people. Now this is huge because the tree can only be God. All of our spiritual sustenance, all of our spiritual nourishment comes from God. Now we see the same relationship in John 15, 5, where we read, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Now here the vine is the roots and the trunk. The saved are the branches. And it is indisputable that the vine represents the Messiah. Likewise, when we come to the olive tree in Romans 11, we are forced to, to embrace the idea that it represents the Messiah. Now, there's also another qualitative difference between the tree and the branches. In Romans 11:16, we read, If the root is holy, so are the branches. Notice that the root has its own intrinsic holiness. The branches derive their holiness from the roots. Now, this means that the roots and the branches aren't different aspects of the same thing. The tree can only be the Messiah, the source of all a man's holiness. There's no other source of holiness. No institution on earth possesses or imparts holiness. The branches are human beings who derive their holiness from the root. And this is a God and man dichotomy. The difference between the roots, and the tree and the roots, and the branches is the difference between God and man. So what is the big picture when we look at the olive tree and its branches? <clears throat> The olive tree with its branches represents the testimony of God on earth. God has anchored himself to this planet to bear testimony, no matter how foul and dark this world gets. God is the sustainer and the provider and the upholder of this testimony. He is the roots and the trunk. Now, the roots and trunk are unchanged throughout the changes that we see in Romans 11 because God doesn't change. But we do see the branches changing because the testimony of God changes as it passes through time. First of all, there's a continual change of branches. As time flows by, folks are added through salvation and folks are removed through death. But there's also dispensational changes and this in particular is the change that we see in Romans 11. Prior to the church age, Israel was the people of God. She was God's testimony on earth. Now, because Israel was a mixed multitude, this means that they were unbelievers that had to be removed when God moved to the church program. Now, the church is one new man, mingling Jewish branches and Gentile branches. And when the church test... <clears throat> And this church testimony has continued now for nearly 2,000 years. But when the church testimony is done and the church is removed at the rapture, God is going to graft the Jews back in to his earthly testimony. But mind you, according to Romans 11.23, this time around he's only going to graft in those who believe. And during the tribulation, it will be Jews with the Gentile proselytes who are bearing the testimony of God. And this testimony will include the last seven years of the law. They're going to be doing the temple. They're going to be doing the Sabbath. They're going to be doing the entire law. Now, it also has to be realized that the testimony of God did not start with Israel. This testimony that God has here on earth of himself manifested through his branches goes all the way back to the garden 
Adam and Eve were the first branches. They were the first testimony. And from the very beginning, this testimony focused on the Messiah. If you recall, back in the early chapters of the Genesis, the first promise of the Messiah was the seed of the woman. Thereafter, God selected the line of Seth, and the testimony of God on earth focused on the Messianic line, though it was not limited to the Messianic line. Later on, God narrowed this focus specifically to the people and nation of Israel, the physical descendants of Jacob. Now, bear in mind again, this testimony centered on Israel. It had a special focus on Israel, but it was not limited to Israel. The godly Gentiles in the surrounding nations realized that the testimony of God was with Israel and her God, and they owned him. So in conclusion, the olive tree is the messianic testimony on earth from Adam to the end of the millennium. In due time, the promised Messiah arose in the nation of Israel of Jewish stock, that is, of the seed of Jacob. And this is why the olive tree is called Israel's own olive tree. Now, they don't have an exclusive right to the tree, but they do have a unique relationship to the tree that transcends all other peoples and nations in history on this planet. And the new covenant is in the Jewish Messiah's blood. It's the only way of salvation. But this new covenant, though it was made particularly with the nation of Israel, was not made exclusively with the nation of Israel. If you recall, the Gentiles were also promised blessing in Abraham's seed. That proved to be Jacob's seed. So Israel is an exclusive source of blessing, in a sense. But she's not the exclusive recipient of that blessing. Eyes wide open, brain engaged, heart on fire. See you next time.